Lydia, thank you so much for being here today. Absolutely. I'm so thrilled to be with you. I have been looking forward to this conversation so much. I just finished your first book. I'm reading your second book. I've been listening to your podcast. You have an incredible voice and so, so much, much Lydia. <laughs> so much Lydia in your life right now. <laughs> Which is good. Oh, so yeah. well. I like to start every interview by asking guests, as a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? Well, I don't really know why this was the case, but for some reason, I wanted to be the person who was the secretary in a doctor's office. Ah. I read about, yeah, I think a receptionist was my dream job. I read about it when, I guess it was sort of like a children's book about jobs you could have. And I don't know, it was something about this particular person had a lot of organizational tools, like sticky notes and all of these things that for some reason really captured my imagination. But the next thing was really a lawyer because my dad was a lawyer and I always thought that I was going to be a lawyer. I thought I was going to go to law school and that mm. was going to be my path. Mm. And for those who don't know you, what do you do today? And how do you think that connects to wanting to be a receptionist to wanting to be a lawyer? So now I'm an auctioneer. I have my own auctioneering agency called the Lydia Finette Agency. And I represent other auctioneers who I've trained as well. So I spend a lot of time on stage. If I'm not on stage, I'm usually speaking. I also have a podcast and I've written two books. But I like to say that everything I do touches that sort of speaking mm. spoke of a wheel, if you will. Although I can't track it back to what I might have been as a receptionist in a doctor's office, I can certainly track it back to being a lawyer because my father was a trial lawyer. And I remember in particular this one trial that he was doing pro bono for a soccer team. And my parents, my mother brought us to watch him. And it was funny to watch my father playing this role of lawyer. And that's what it looks like as a child. Dad's playing lawyer, but <laughs> that was actually his job. And it's funny now to bring my children, especially my oldest daughter who loves theater. She sees me on stage as an auctioneer. And so they understand my job. They know what I do, but I think they think I play auctioneer, <laughs> which I guess is kind of the way that we all feel as we grow up. Maybe that we're just playing a role. Mm -hmm. Well, I love following along and what you have to share around confidence. And this is a big topic that a lot of us want to grow in. Yes. and become more confident. And I know you just wrote a book, Claim Your Confidence, around the topic of confidence. And then your first book, The Most Powerful Woman in the Room, is you. There's so much I want to ask you. When did you realize that confidence was something that you wanted to help other women with? So I wrote The Most Powerful Woman in the Room is You because there was always a woman who would come up to me after I got off stage as an auctioneer mm -hmm. and tell me how the they could never do what I did. I could never do what you do. I'm so bad at selling. I could never do what you do. I just mm. could never ask people for things because when I ask them, they respond negatively and it makes me think that they don't like me. And it always was seen in such a negative light. That's really why I wrote my first book. And then when I was on book tour for my first book, the question that I kept getting over and over again was, how are you so confident? Mm. Where did you get your confidence? Is there anything you can tell me about how I could be confident like mm -hmm. you. And I don't think I grew up as the most confident person in the world. I was probably like most kids sort of seeking confidence through relationships, through approval from people around me. Mm -hmm. But over the course of my life, what I've realized is when you seek that approval and you're desperate to ask other people what they think about what you should do with their life, or if you're doing it right, am I doing mm -hmm. it right? This is what this is supposed to be you actually strip away your confidence mm. because you're giving away what you really intuitively know on the inside to be true. And you're thinking that somebody else has the answer. I talk a lot and claim your confidence about the importance of realizing that this is your life. Nobody has the answer that you have for your life. And so when you spin your wheels, certainly you want to surround yourself with people who are intelligent and want the best for you. But ultimately the question is, what do you want with mm. your life? When you realize that's where confidence comes from and from stepping into that and understanding that some people may not agree with what you want to do. Some people may not like what you want to do, but it's not about that. It's about what you want to do. Yeah. I'm a coach. I do executive coaching, career coaching. And one of the things I share with my clients is the concept of the inner leader and tapping into that voice. Because a lot of times we do look for the answer in other people and that voice is there to guide us if we're yeah. willing to tap into it. I also like to tell clients, if you're okay with it, I'd love to read an excerpt from your book that really resonated with me. So 
something that I've learned through coaching and that I like to share with clients is that a lot of times we think we have to have confidence first and mm -hmm. then do. And what I found is that the confidence comes from the doing. The more we do, the more confident we become. Yes. And for a lot of people, that's a big aha moment mm -hmm. of, oh, I thought I needed to be confident first and then go out and speak. I thought yeah. I needed to be confident and then go out and look for the job change or the whatever. And yeah. it sounds like that's not how you view confidence. Yeah. In fact, <laughs> I 100% agree with you. If you could see me right now, I'm nodding with everything we've been <laughs> saying. It's all about getting comfortable, getting uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You have to put yourself out there to understand what you're capable of. And I do this to myself all the time. Mm -hmm. If I find that I get scared, if I'm feeling that kind of like nervous energy, mm -hmm. I know I'm on the right track mm -hmm. because it's probably something I haven't done before. It's probably something where I feel like I'm throwing caution to the wind a little bit. And then when I do it, the amount of confidence I gain from that mm -hmm. is where the learning comes from. Because not only have I proven to myself that I could do something that I didn't think I could do, but I've overcome this fear of doing it. Mm -hmm. And that's really where the growth comes from. And it's interesting because it's very easy to live in a bubble. If you don't want to do scary things, you don't have to do them. But unfortunately, what that doesn't do is prepare you for those moments in life when something that you don't think could ever happens, or you lose your job out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. You think you've had this trajectory over the course of your life. It's supposed to look like X, you lose your job. What do you do? Mm -hmm. You watch people who've been through moments that are hard come back stronger. You watch people also crumble and allow themselves to crumble and find holes and stay in that hole as long as they can, because it feels good and safe and comfortable to think that they can't do more than that. And I think that we would all prefer to be the person who takes that hit and maybe is sad about it, but then keeps going, understands it's just part of the game. This is what's going to happen over the course of your life. And you can run that across anything through relationships, through jobs, through relationships with friends. Those are all things that can take hits and come back unless you choose to sit and wallow, which is another way to look at it. But I truly believe that to claim your confidence, you have to get comfortable getting uncomfortable. Hmm. Well, that brings me back to that excerpt, which I'll read now. You said, if you are going to claim your confidence, this will be a part of your journey. You have to put yourself in situations where you're putting yourself out there and where failure is a very real possibility. There will be highs, there will be lows, and there will be many times that are somewhere in between. You might think that these challenging moments are the ones to forget, but actually you need to flip the script. These are the moments that make the journey worth it. These are the moments that ground us, center us, and remind us that no matter how great everything is in your life, life will always have a way of reminding you that you're human. Confidence comes from understanding that and pushing forward. Like that is a great book. <laughs> we book? should go buy it. <laughs> <laughs> like, I feel like I'm nodding along and I was like, yeah, because I wrote every single one of those words <laughs> that I agree with everything that we said. No, I just really do believe that. The last chapter of this book, I talk about a car accident that I have mm -hmm. with my entire family as I'm finishing this book. So I'd finished 11 chapters of the book. I had one chapter left to write mm -hmm. and I had about two months until my deadline. And it was Halloween of 2021. And my three children, my husband and I were hit head on by a car that flipped over the guardrail coming in the other direction. And I definitely did not know that I was going to live. And that was the beginning of it all. I woke up to my husband blacked out next to me and all of my children screaming my name. I didn't know where I was. I didn't know what had happened. I hadn't been looking up. It had happened so fast. Ultimately, thank God my children were okay. They had broken bones. We all were in a hospital for, I was there for the longest stay, almost 12 days because I had broken seven ribs and fractured my spine. I had to have a spinal fusion. My husband had shattered his left wrist and had to have a titanium rod put in. My children were in the pediatric ward. My family had to move in because my husband and I were sharing a room in the hospital. I mean, it was really about as horrible as you can imagine. And on top of that, when we first came in, they weren't even sure I was going to live through the whole thing. So when you hit something like that, in your life, especially when you're writing a book about confidence. And I'll tell you, honestly, there was never a moment after we knew that I would live, that I wasn't a hundred percent sure I would recover and come back stronger. Mm -hmm. I knew it at the core. And mm -hmm. I wrote the last chapter of the book five weeks after the accident. I'd had my wow. spinal fusion. I was bedridden. I was only allowed to stand up for limited amount of times just because the pain was so intense. And I wrote it in one sitting, the whole thing. And I really explored this notion of confidence and being confident mm. in ourselves. And 
knowing and having gone through something that was really that close to skirting death and still feeling confident in who I was. And mm. the fact that I would recover and come back, like all of those things brought me back to where mm. I am today, which is, I truly believe a stronger person and a more grateful person, a more grounded person, a more open person to mm. opportunities. And so much of this, again, has been through challenging myself, through getting back on a pair of skis, even though I wasn't allowed to bend, lift, or twist for six months, and making my husband and children go surfing, even though they'd never tried it. My husband's wrist is now titanium, and my back is titanium, just so my children could understand that their parents were strong. Mm -hmm. And those are things that I've realized now on the other side of that, I push even harder now because I know how much more confident I become. And how much more confident my children and family are when we realize how strong we really are. Although obviously a horrific thing, a moment in my life I would never take back because that understanding has given me such depth and such empathy for other people who are going through hard times. And the reminder, as I said, in that last sentence, like we will all be tested because we're all human and that's the way life works. Wow. It makes me want to cry, but I have a family. I have two kids, my husband, and I'm picturing myself in that situation and how terrifying that must have been. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that. And thank you for sharing it in the book, because I think that'll resonate with a lot of people. I like to think that I'm training my brain every time that I do something uncomfortable, that I'm getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. And as you talked about the surfing and how you had to train your brain, you were probably scared, I assume. It was freezing. We were in Los Angeles and it was December. I was like, we're going surfing. And even as we pulled up to this random van and parking lot, my, everybody was like, there's no one else here. I'm like, it's fine. And the guys we don't usually surf here in December because it's usually warmer during the year. I was like, oh, we're going in, kids. <laughs> and um, what impact that must have on your kids too. Yeah. To yeah. really witness that and see that. I hope so. Well, one of the things that I notice about you, Lydia, is this almost like light is, okay. that comes from you. Well, even just as you post videos on social media, you're just smiling. I heard you mention the accident in your latest podcast episode, and I wasn't familiar with it at all. And I haven't gotten to that part of the book. And so I thought, wow, like that must be part of why she seems so grateful. Yeah. And it seems like you love life and yeah. you're not apologetic about it. I'm not. I'll tell you, it's a remarkable thing to go through something like that. And there are two parts. There's the part, the awareness about yourself and the fact that life ends, which I'm in my forties. I don't really think about death, honestly, at all, or I didn't before that. And the other part was also this unbelievable awareness of the community that we have created mm. over the course of our lives. And I think back to those times, and I talk about this in the last chapter of my parents and my in-laws and my siblings moving into the hospital room mm. with my children. Each of my children had their own hospital room, the pediatric mm. ward. I couldn't move because my spine was fractured for four days and I hadn't had the surgery. So I couldn't even get out of bed and I just couldn't move. I mean, my body was so bruised and broken and my friends, how they came to the hospital, they devised a system to get mm. in because they were only allowing two people at a time where they would pass their tags and bring in donuts and like put them <laughs> under the donuts so people couldn't tell. And I think at some point the nurses just kind of turned a blind eye to the fact that I had like 60 sisters <laughs> who look nothing like me. And I'm tall, like, my redhead friend comes in, my one friend comes in, my friend who looks so Italian comes in, with a tan in the middle of like, you cannot even believe. And she's like, the fact that they just let me in is crazy. because <laughs> We do not look like sisters. And I was like, well, maybe it's helpful that I, my entire face is bruised and my body's broken. Oh my I just God. can't really tell. They don't know how tall I am, maybe. It really was something. And then when we got home, everybody else got home about nine days before I did. And when I got home, my mom was with us for almost six weeks, really doing everything. Because as I said, I couldn't bend over, couldn't lift anything, I couldn't twist. So I did basically squat to pick anything up off the ground. And my doorbell didn't stop for the first three days. Hmm. It just was coming in. It was like, flowers and food every day mm -hmm. and just socks and like anything anyone could think of to send us was just coming and coming and coming. It was like my mom and I would just laugh. So like, <laughs> dang, I should turn around. Like the bell just kept ringing. And then the notes and the calls and the love, there was like nowhere to go because anytime I opened my eyes to look at a message or see something, it was just this outpouring of love and support. And you feel that to your core. 
when there is a gratitude that comes with saying something like that. Hmm. What else has changed? I think you mentioned the confidence piece and what you've learned about confidence and anything that came out from that learnings for you. I've always been a very grateful person. I've always understood Mm -hmm. the importance of gratitude. And I have definitely always understood the power of positivity. I think if you knew me even before the accident, I am a positive person. But this interesting thing that happened the night I went in for my spinal fusion. So this is four days. I've been at the hospital for four days. Mm -hmm. I'd come in the OR in really bad shape. And after I saw my children, they brought me back in. This is the night of the accident for an internal surgery to see if I was bleeding out internally. And I was in the OR. And I just remember thinking to myself, like, I don't think everybody here understands how cool I am. (laughs) I'm a really fun and cool person. I deserve to live. But also, I mean, everyone's, they're also serious. And so the only thing I could think of to make myself feel like me was I started throwing in one-liners. So everyone is so (laughs) serious. They're like, no, we don't know. We're going to have to start cutting all your organs out. I was like, that sounds bad. I also have a bunion that I've been meaning to get. So if we're going to just like take all of our, what, and everyone there is so serious because the stakes are not, I mean, it is a bad situation. I'm kind of like giggling to myself because I think it's so funny. And the doctor's like, we can't do that. (laughs) And I was like, right. And then another doctor said, what did you eat today before the surgery? Because you're supposed to have time between like when you have surgery. I don't even know. You're not supposed to eat for like a day before surgery. And I said, well, I just ate about 200 pieces of Halloween candy back to back in (laughs) the wrong period. And he was like, huh? And he goes, hey, you have a really good metabolism. And I was like, I really, I think that might be the biggest compliment I've ever received. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like maybe this is it. Maybe this is the high of my life. And he just kind of cracked a smile. And he asked me about my birthday. And I'm like, don't, I'm sorry. Like, I'm not, you see that number. Don't that number. <laughs> and it was just like, that made me feel more confident in who I was. And anyway, so when I went back down for the spinal fusion, four days later, you're in a trauma hospital. So you keep getting bumped by the craziest trauma that comes in. So I was supposed to go at seven in the morning and then there were just accidents and things mm-hmm. happening all day. So I didn't go into one thirty the next morning. And wheeled me down to the OR. And there was one person there, there's a woman there. And she came over and she said, how are you doing? And I was like, I'm doing pretty well. And she was like, you know, not a lot of people would describe that as like right before a spinal fusion that they're doing pretty well. And she said, are you the mom who came in on Halloween? And I said, I am the mom who came in on Halloween. And she said, I knew you would be okay because you were smiling and cracking jokes when things were so bad. She's like, I've worked here. I think she's like, I've worked here for 20 years. And she's like, you see people your age who come in and don't make it, even though they should, because they come in just in this sort of funk and they don't believe that they're going to be. And she's like, we see 85 and 90 year old people who should not walk out of here, who skip out of here. And to me, it was really an affirmation of everything I've ever believed about positivity, that it allows you to push through the hard times. It brings you healing and comfort to you, but also to other people. Think about how hard her job is. The fact that I was able to cut through in that 15 minutes that I was in there waiting to go into surgery. Like that's an incredible thing to know about positivity. Like it's that much of a differentiator for someone. And so I always say with positivity, it's twofold. Like, yes, it's good to make you feel good about yourself and have a great attitude, but think about the world you live in and the impact your positivity has on other people, Mm -hmm. because that's the other beauty of being positive. If you can't do it for yourself, look around you and realize how many people have a better day because you're kind or because you show up in a positive way. It's easiest to see in an office. If you're a boss, I was boss for almost two decades. Like you can kill everyone's day in two seconds, right? You walk in a bad mood, everyone's in a bad mood. You walk in in a good mood, people shore up. Hmm. That reminds me of what Oprah says around be responsible for the energy you bring into a room. Everything you just shared, I 100% agree. I really believe that our gratitude, our positivity can affect even how quickly we heal, all of those things. And it says a lot about you that you were willing to make a joke to kind of make others feel more comfortable or to relax, right? Tell me if this is correct. Like you're very empathetic and you can read the room. And so even saying a joke and then the nurse reacting to that, right? It made her day. Yeah, I I guess really powerful. Yeah. And I think it's also the other side of that is like, I don't like being pitied. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I don't like pity as an emotion. I don't like being pitied. And I feel like, again, it kind of goes back to that confidence piece. I'm like, listen, 
I know things aren't great, but I'm going to be fine. Like I want everyone to understand that I know that my body is broken, but my spirit is a hundred percent here. Mm. And it's like, do what you will. I'll figure this piece out. And I talk about in that last chapter too, like sitting in the car after Chris and the kids had gotten out of the car. And I was just kind of left there waiting for the ambulance. I went there. I mean, at that point, the left side of my face had been kind of cut open. And so I couldn't see anything out of my left eye because it had bled over it. So when I opened my eyes, it was kind of like a kaleidoscope. I couldn't see anything out of my left eye. So I kind of assumed that I was blind and I couldn't feel my body at all. Like the adrenaline had flooded me. I could still feel my fingers and toes, but I couldn't feel my body. I couldn't move. Like my husband came over to get me out of the car. I'm like, I can't move. And I remember thinking like, all right, if you're paralyzed, you'll be okay. Like, it's not going to be easy. Don't like, Mm -hmm. this is going to be an easy path, but you'll be okay. Like you're still the same person. You're still in there. That even now, when I think back on that thought process, like it takes a lot to go there and be like, this isn't going to be great, but I'm going to be okay. And I truly believed that. And I still believe that now. I want to also dive into some of the other things I've learned from you, even though I just met you, I've learned through you, <laughs> through your book. And one of the things is your passion. And I think this all ties back to your positivity, your gratitude, the fact that you're here on a podcast with a woman you don't know. And <laughs> you, right? I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I just like love that about you, that you're so willing to help other women. And you talk about it in your first book and I assume you're going to talk about it in this book too, but you said something you learned from, I think you said your dad, the network yeah, or die, or maybe it was your mom. Yeah. I can't no, remember. it was my dad. It was, it was my dad. dad. Okay. Okay. Network or die. Yeah. <laughs> and you give a lot of advice in your book. I highly recommend it. And then you starting a breakfast for women to help women connect. And I found that very inspiring, my top values connection. And I thought, mm-hmm. Ooh, how can I start a breakfast. Maybe you can start a breakfast so easily. It's yeah, the best like, thing. Yeah. I was like, Oh, I should reach out to my friend, Hannah, and I should reach out to my friend, Sandy, and we should put something together. And I just found it so inspiring. And on top of that, based on the table of contents, you dive into this in your second book, but you are a mom of three, you own your own agency, you have a lot going on. And so the fact that you're willing to get on a podcast or throw up breakfast. Like that is so inspiring. Can you talk about your mindset around that? I know. Yeah. No, I do. I talk in my chapter called say farewell to the work-life balance myth. I talk a little bit about how we're all programmed to think that there is a balance in life. I don't really think that's true. I think we're all just kind of trying to keep one scale from slamming against the floor while the other one's like flying in the air. And so I really try to mentally frame my year in sprints and plateaus. I use this language with my friends. I use this language with my children. To your point about why I'm on a podcast in July, I sprint during the spring. That's my peak public speaking, peak auction season. It is when I am full throttle. I don't stop. I'm on planes. I'm on stage. Like it's crazy. And what I say to the kids when they're like, oh, wait, but you have to go away tonight or you're going to be out tonight. I'm like, I'm in a sprint. And you guys know this will plateau. Hmm. When I'm in a sprint, anything that is not for my family or my best friends or my parents or my siblings, if it is not something that is business critical, it doesn't happen. Hmm. Things start to settle down. We take a family vacation every year. That's like what we do. We go away for two weeks. It's like, I'm not on, and I don't answer emails. I don't get on my work emails. I just kind of let everything sit. And then in July, I don't have a single auction at night. I just came from dropping off my son off the camp and I'll be picking them up in an hour. And this is when I do the podcasts. I mean, I have a ton of podcasts. I do a lot of informational calls. I do a lot of coffee meetings. Like this is the time for me during the summer to do the things I don't have time to do when I'm in a sprint. So this is my plateau season. And this is what I enjoy doing. I love connecting people. Mm. I love breakfast. I love meeting new people. I love just talking about people's business ideas and helping them kind of pinpoint a couple of things to do just for fun. And so this is the time that I do that when my brain has a chance to sort of sit and Mm. think and run and play tennis and the things that I really enjoy doing that I can't do when I'm in a sprint. So I say to people a lot, if you find yourself in this place where you're constantly just spinning and spinning and spinning, and there seems to be no strategy to your life, like really think about the times when you're busy and don't try to overpack those past what the priorities are in your life. And then when things open up again, 
That's when you can dream and ideate and create and talk and network and do those other things. And then I think you find yourself in a place where I'm in business mode. Like I'm in sprint mode. I need to get to bed. I'm not going out late for dinner. I am not going to have that glass of wine. Mm. Like this is my time to go to the gym, do the things I know are going to make me feel good and make me at peak, almost like an athlete. Mm. And then you, know, you plateau and you have that extra glass of wine to dinner and you do the podcast with nice people who reach yeah. out to you, who you think look interesting and want to speak to. <laughs> and you try the things that you don't have time to do when you're in the mm. middle of a sprint. And tell me, so I'm a mom, I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old, mm -hmm. and I used to be in a prior life, in a prior career, I was in accounting, financial reporting, and that was not the right fit for me. I'm very much a people person. So now I do coaching and I love it. I feel like it's a calling. I love what I do. You have such a nice, calm demeanor. I'm sure people like love to be coached by you because they're <laughs> oh, like, you're so nice. <laughs> thank you. They tell me I have a calming effect on them when they're high stress. You do. <laughs> just, well, I'm talking to you. <laughs> Absolutely. I agree. <laughs> I used to work a lot and that gives me a lot of appreciation for my clients who are stressed out. And now that I love what I do, it can be very tempting to overcommit yes. to what I love. And then I just came back from, I was at the Aspen Ideas Festival and it was such a cool experience. Got to hear some cool speakers, all of that. I want to do more of that. And I love that. And I love connecting, meeting people. And then I feel guilt of, well, but I'm leaving my kids for a week. And then they met us for a week in Colorado and that was fun. And we spent time together. So that was fine. But I come across our, oh, there's another thing that I'd love to do, but then that might take me away from the kids. So I have a good gig. I work from home. I'm virtual. I have flexibility and freedom. What would you say to me and to other moms listening or parents listening who are struggling with that? You know, I don't know that that goes away. I think we all feel like that over the course of our lives. I certainly do. I kind of go back to what I said a little bit earlier about the sprints and plateaus, but I also borrow from something I read in a book called the 10, 10, 10 principle. And I think about this on the days where I'm feeling really like, oh God, everything feels unnerving and my kids are going to hate me and all these things because I've been gone for California twice this week for one day and I've red eyed home because that's what mom, it's like, we just, I heard you do it. Like I went to Colorado for a week and then I went, but then we all had fun for a week. You know, it's like, we all do it. We're like, oh. I did this work of week and I really enjoyed it and it was fulfilling. But then I did this other thing for the kids. It's like, it's okay. You don't have to overcompensate. Mm -hmm. You are allowed to enjoy your life and have a full and present adult life, just as you are allowed to enjoy being a mom. And that can fill you up too. But you have to know what fills you up. And mm -hmm. can you be a good mom if you're not filling up your own cup? Or do you end up being a resentful mom because you feel like the time that you want to put into something that you really love and that will fulfill you and stay with you over the course of your life. Like you can't get there because you are doing something for your children, which doesn't make you feel like that. So I think that those two things are always going to be a little bit of a struggle for women, mm. because in my opinion, that's sort of inherent. You birth mm. the children or you care for them from the day that they're born and they're part of you. You're always thinking about them. But what I will say is when it comes to that mom guilt, just remember in the 10, 10, 10 principle that whenever you're making a decision, think to yourself, all right, is my child going to remember this in 10 minutes? Mm -hmm. Like, you know what? They really wanted me to come to see this thing outside, but I have this call and I need to take it like in 10 minutes after I say yes or no, is this child going to remember that? Right. In 10 days, will they remember that in 10 years? Will they remember that? And when you really start to think about like the things that if I miss this in 10 years, will my child still be like, I can't believe you missed that. Mm. You should probably try to be there if it's possible. And I think that's actually a really pretty good thing because if you think about it, sometimes you're like, oh gosh, if I go away for like that seventh day, instead of taking six days, like maybe 10 minutes after you tell them you're going to stay for that extra day, they're going to be upset. 10 days later, they're not going to remember. And trust me in 10 years, the difference between <laughs> six and seven days. I do think about that when it gets to that point where I just feel like I'm stretched really thin. And I'm like, they're in their routine. They're with their dad who loves them as much as I do. They're mm -hmm. doing what they want to do every day. Like, is that extra day going to kill them? But is it going to really fill me up? Then I'm going to take it. Mm -hmm. That's so funny you say that because I've thought about things like that. Like, no, I'm just going to go back an extra day early because I don't want to have an extra night away. And 
I mean, how many red eyes have I taken? And then I come home so shattered. And then the kids are like, do you want to do this? And I'm like crawling into my bed. I'm like, so no, tired. Like, he just stayed, slept on the plane. And I could have come back a fully formed human being. Now I'm going to be shattered for four days, likely not in the greatest mood for most <laughs> of that time as I kind of get my sleep back. So yeah, being a mom isn't easy. It just isn't. There's no way to make it easier because at the end of the day, I think most of us have something in us that just always pulls us back to our kids. And so again, going back to gratitude, I try to go back to that on those days when I'm just feeling stretched in a million days. I'm like, I have these kids. I think they want me to be there. Like, I'm happy to be there, but it is tough. And I empathize with any woman out there. I certainly have cried many a time on the flight when the flight gets delayed and it's ruined a plan to get home to see something. But I've also, on the other side, I've really lived a very full life and that fills me up too. So I feel like I'm able to be present for my kids in a big way. And I know when they see me on stage that to this day, my son said to his teacher who told me, one of those moments that gave me full goosebumps during a parent-teacher conference, she said, oh, you know, Henry said that his favorite, oh no, sorry, not Henry, Beatrice, my oldest daughter said that her favorite thing that she's ever seen, the most amazing thing she's ever seen is to see her mom on stage. Oh. Yeah. And so they notice, they see you showing up for yourself and they notice that. I hmm. love that. Well, I want to make sure I touch on the networking piece because I think this is probably one of your superpowers. Yes. I would guess. Tell us, what are your thoughts on networking? What advice would you give to listeners on the power of networking? So Just important. tell us all the things. So network or die is <laughs> my dad's catchphrase. Not that you will die if you don't network, but that your business will die. But I also believe that people forget the most important thing about networking. And it's someone else's quote that I will attribute to myself just for this podcast. But everybody that you meet knows something and someone that you do not. Like, think about that. So whatever you're doing, especially in business, if you meet one other person over the course of your life, they know something and someone you don't. Mm -hmm. So it behooves you to meet every single person you ever can. I'll give you an example of this. I was in LA for an auction and I was in line at Delta and I struck up a conversation with the guys behind me. These two men were married. And as we were talking, one of them had a Southern accent. And I said, I detect a Southern accent there. And he said, yeah, I'm from Louisiana. And I said, I'm from Louisiana. And so we're weaving on the Delta line and we're talking and we're talking, we're talking and we get to the front and I tell him I'm an auctioneer and I'd taken this auction the night before and Kim Kardashian had been there. We were just chatting. And we end up getting to the front. We go to our separate ways. They get on their flight. I get on their flight, never to be seen again. I got an email on my website three weeks later. And the gentleman who had reached out was the head of PR for one of the largest law firms in the Southeast. And he basically was like, I want you to come speak at our company. And my agent who knows that I love to network and I'm always <laughs> meeting people and sending them to her. I'm like, oh, I met this guy. He asked me to speak at his company. You know, this, where'd you meet him? Oh, I sat next to him on a plane. I talk to everyone always, especially in moments where other people are in work mode, business class on an airplane, in a Delta Sky Lounge, in a Sky Priority Lounge. Like those are moments where someone's probably traveling during the week and that's why they're there. And so I think this for her was kind of the penultimate. And yeah, so that is how I got one of my biggest speaking gigs ever was through the line at Delta. So wow. I talk about networking. That's what I mean by networking. Not, oh, I'm putting on a plastic name tag and I'm doing this. It's networking with everyone you've ever met. So this mm -hmm. breakfast that I started with my friend Courtney really was because of that. Courtney and I would have these conversations about all these amazing women we knew, but then the other person didn't know them. So she would say, oh, Mary said this. I'm like, who is that? I'm like, Karen said that. Like, it was always just like this weird sort of back and forth about people that the other person didn't know. And so we ended up putting together a breakfast. And what we did was we both invited five people that the other person didn't know. And we sat around the table thinking that this was going to be sort of a corporate networking breakfast because everyone was in some kind of work at that point, mm -hmm. kind of corporation. This is pre-COVID. And the only question we asked was, what are you working on? Mm -hmm. And I think one of the first women who started speaking said, well, I guess I'm working on having a baby and my mm. round of IVF that I just went through didn't work. And then she kind of burst into tears. Courtney and I are kind of looking at each other like, wait, this is not, <laughs> that's not what I meant, but we're women. There's so many different things. I mean, especially yeah. we were having these early networking breakfasts. We were in our thirties. And of course that was a huge topic in New York. That's when women have babies for the most part. And so 
it was a really interesting Mm. entree into this new networking world that we were encountering. And another woman at the breakfast reached across the table and was like, I just went through it. I went through multiple rounds, but I had a baby and I will tell you anything you need to know. And there was another woman who was like, I've been through it too. Mm. And that conversation has been had many times around the networking breakfast table. Like IVF is a huge topic that we've gone through over the years, starting businesses, losing jobs, writing books, like all of these things have become things that we're working on. Mm -hmm. And because we do it between four and six times a year, as a result of that, it's been this sort of like accountability check for all of us. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I remember telling everyone I was writing a book, they're like, how's it going? I'm like, and this is what's happening now. And this is what's happening now. And it's just kept growing and growing and growing. So that breakfast pre-COVID, we were in the 20s, like maybe 20 to 30 people at any given time. And anyone could bring anyone they wanted. It was like, if you encounter someone who's stuck in their career, send them our email, like no harm, no foul, they can come or not. There's nothing holding you here. You don't pay anything. There's no fee. You just come. And everyone just pays for their own breakfast. And post-COVID, a membership club in the city heard about it and was like, would you ever want to host this here? And we did it. And then they said, do you mind if we open it up to our membership for a couple of people? We're like, no, it'd be fun to have new people who we don't know. And they had only five spots. I think they had 65 people on the wait list. And we had 60 people at the breakfast. And it's just taken on a life of its own. And so that is what I mean by network or die. Like that is the power of network. And especially post COVID, that's the power of connectivity. So if you have a business, your hand should be out there at every opportunity. You know, you're in line (laughs) at Starbucks, strike up a conversation with the person behind you. You never know what they do. You never know if you can help them or they can help you. And that's the beauty of it. It's kind of like Mm -hmm. great unknown. I love that. I'm getting excited to think about, okay, what could I do? What could I do? Start a breakfast. Like seriously, it's the easiest thing. Call your friend and be like, bring four people I've never met. I'll bring four people you don't know. Let's sit down at a coffee shop for two hours and just like make it a breakfast because breakfast is the easiest one to not cancel on. Mm. Well, that makes me think too of something else. So at this Aspen Ideas Festival that I was at a couple of weeks ago, David Brooks, who's an author and has a book coming out here in October, was speaking and he talked about connecting with people and being really present and looking people in the eyes and just not like looking around to see who else is in the room, who else is more important to go talk to. Really connecting with when you're with someone, really being there. And it sounds like you do that. What's your perspective on that? Like, it sounds like you're there. Yeah. Like you're talking to that person at Delta. You don't know what they do or whatever, but you're talking to them. And then that led to some, a big opportunity. You didn't lead with, well, I asked him what he did for work. And then once I decided whether he was important enough, like you, so what's your perspective on that? My perspective is that I a hundred percent agree with him. I think that if you go into any relationship and it's transactional, it's totally over the minute you open your mouth. Why are you meeting someone? What's the point of connectivity? What do you know? You know, the Southern accent for me is easy. I live in New York. And if you're Southern and you live in New York, you always want to meet other Southern people who live in New York. We're like, how did you get here? But I really do think that networking is about the human experience. It's about that connective piece. And you don't know where you find it. You don't know what it is about the person who's seated next to you on an airplane or on a podcast or walking into a store at the same time that you do when you have a long line and a little extra time. What does it hurt to strike up a conversation with someone? Mm -hmm. And people are always like, well, what do you say? Like, ask questions. People love to talk about themselves. They do. They love to be asked about who they are, what brought them there, why are they there? And I truly believe, especially in this world that we live in with our iPhones, where everyone's staring at their phones all the day, it's so nice to actually have somebody who is interested in making eye contact and learning about you and asking those questions. So it's really such an easy thing. It doesn't have to be difficult. And it's even more fun when you can connect somebody and help them. That is, to me, the most exciting thing when I meet someone and I'm like, oh, wait, I met someone last week who would love to meet you. You want to do this? And this person was talking about this and let's put you two together. And that's how they call people like that. Super connectors. I think I'm like a super warp connector. I love <laughs> connecting everyone. I always want my friends to be friends. I'm like, you have the same name. Let's all be friends. And everyone's like, what? <laughs> but it just is so much more fun. The bigger your friend and your network pool is because you have so many ideas and so many things to learn from other people around you Mm. always. And you always have extra resources to answer questions that you might Mm. have. There's not a limit on it. No, 
there's no limit. I had 13 bridesmaids. My husband was like, cap. cap." (laughs) He's like, I have five friends. So I don't even know who to ask anymore. Everyone else people I've met. I was like, because I was also thinking this other person that I met a couple weeks ago. (laughs) Well, Lydia, I like to end podcast conversations by asking guests. It sounds like you love your work and what you do. I do. What would you say to someone listening who maybe sitting at their desk and thinking, yeah, I don't love what I do. I'm not energized by it. I'm not excited about it. What would you say to that person? What would be your advice? If you are in a place in your life right now where you financially can stop doing that. Great. It's not the case for most of us. Certainly wasn't the case for me. So what I often say to people is build up your life raft while you're on the boat Mm -hmm. until the life raft is bigger than the boat you're on and then hop on that one. (laughs) So I unintentionally did that in my old job at Christie's. I knew that I was tiring of what I was doing. I had been doing it for so long. I just Mm -hmm. didn't have enthusiasm and passion. Was I able to do it? Yes. The auctioneering piece I always loved, but I'd been doing partnerships kind of towards the end of my career as we entered COVID at that point for over 10 years, 11 Mm. years. I'd run events for 10 years for the company. I just didn't show up with that enthusiasm and that passion that I have for so many things in my life. But I felt that spark when I wrote my first book. Mm. And I think that's why I wrote my second book, because I felt that spark. And I could see my eyes sort of shifting towards this other thing that gave me such joy. And I was so excited about, and I couldn't wait to do more of. And then post COVID, just sitting on zoom day after day, doing something Mm -hmm. that you're not that enthusiastic about just sucks away over time. And I feel like I was able to do it. I needed to do it because of the paycheck. I thought that was sort of my path. And then ultimately after the accident, Chrissy's was restructuring. There was, they didn't really need partnerships anymore. And so it was the perfect time for me to not be in a full-time role there anymore and take an ambassador position. And then, as I said, over time, over those years, that lifeboat had gotten so much bigger, the boat that I was on, that it was almost like I was climbing a ladder to get up to it. And so when I started my agency, which happened about three months ago and ended my ambassadorship with Christie's, it wasn't even, people were like, were you nervous? I was like, I actually wasn't nervous at all. It was such a natural fit. But I needed to be doing what I was doing nine to five to have a job, to have that paycheck, to have the benefits until I didn't need that anymore because I was able to provide that in my own. Mm -hmm. So if you're at your desk right now and you need that job, go in there and do the job that you're meant to do. Put a smile on your face. If it's not lighting the world on fire, that's okay. Mm -hmm. But look for the thing that is, and then you can build those things simultaneously. And when it's time to go, you can do it in a way that is honoring what you've left behind and being enthusiastic about what's to come. Thank you so much for being here. I enjoyed this so much. I was so excited. Thank you. Thank you for having me on your show. It's such an honor to be here. Where can people buy your book? Where can people follow along? So if you want to buy my book, please buy it in an independent bookstore. I love a bookstore. There's an amazing one called Diane's Books up in Greenwich. There's another one called Arcade in Rye. Just anywhere you are, anywhere you live, McNally Jackson in New York City, which is where I live, has another one. But all of those are great independent bookstores. If you can't find it there, Amazon has it. Amazon actually has everything as we know, but I do love an independent bookstore. So find it there. Otherwise, follow along on Instagram at Lydia Finette. I'm busy. You can see. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, Lydia. Not dull.